we are looking at this uh, new carbon family and in yesterday's lecture I specifically covered on the various uh, uh, aspects of uh, this new carbons uh, which are identified the discoveries uh, that underlies this new allotropic forms and also specifically we discussed about uh, the chemistry of fullerenes. In today's topic, uh, I would like to focus little bit more on uh, the carbon nanotubes because of its application um, and then we will also look into the issues uh, related to graphene, uh, the discovery and the properties related to graphene. So, just as a quick recap of what we saw yesterday on carbon nanotubes. We said carbon nanotubes are those which are confined in one dimension and uh, the way we roll these graphene sheets in different uh, uh, vectors uh, determines whether we get a zigzag uh, carbon nanotube or a chiral or an armchair type and uh, depending on the way it is scrolled, it also alters the electronic property and therefore, you can look for a metal or a semi-metal or a semiconductor <coughs> and uh, the chiral uh, vectors are all also the ones which decide uh, <coughs> the, the angle with respect to the CH vector and therefore, uh, we can get uh, different forms of carbon nanotubes and uh, we also looked at another view graph where we said uh, there are three uh, basic ways of preparing one is uh, CVD technique another one is the arc discharge and also we have another uh, technique uh, using lasers. So, there are variety of ways that we can release this carbon nanotubes and uh, uh, one of the controlled way of growing this carbon nanotubes is to grow in one dimension as pillars. So, how do we do that? Take methane and uh, put that on porous silicon and porous silicon is actually capped with the iron uh, as nucleating centers. So, the carbon nanotube will actually get uh, will keep growing on the iron uh, clusters. As you see here, these are the iron regions, iron patterns and uh, these iron patterns will help the carbon nanotubes to grow in this fashion and uh, what we see here in this uh, view graph is uh, the oriented crystal growth. So, if you can actually pattern your uh, porous silicon in this way as you see from the top then you can find out uh, or you can realize such nanostructures growing in a preferred oriented form. So, these are patterned uh, way of growing silicon um, nanofibers. So, you do not necessarily need to get a, a bundle, but it can be streamlined the growth can be streamlined and therefore, the growth process is actually a base growth mode which means it will only nucleate on a particular metal where it is catalytically getting decomposed and it grows and if you pattern the base then accordingly the growth of the uh, carbon nanotube also proceeds. If you do not pattern then you get a bunch or a like a forest it grows in one direction. Uh, so, the growth mechanisms are very important to uh, understand the electronic and mechanical properties because both are dependent on the atomic structure of uh, the tube. Uh, what we need to understand is that uh, what are the parameters that control the size number of shells if it is multi wall and the helicity and uh, structure during the synthesis. What has been uh, proved and established is that there is no way you can grow a carbon nanotube without a metal catalyst therefore, that is much important for the synthesis of nanotubes and the size dependency comes with the nature of catalyst and the growth temperature etcetera. Now, uh, regarding the mechanism of uh, single wall uh, growth uh, or multi wall, uh, 
Um, there are different models that are proposed to understand because uh, this happens in a very transient way. Therefore, one does not really know uh, what is the mode by which uh, multi walls uh, propagate or single walls propagate, but there is some fair idea about how the whole thing happens. Open ended growth of multi wall nanotubes seems to occur mainly because of the role of hexagons and pentagons um, which play the important role in propagating this along one axis. Uh, as you see here this these are C 2 clusters, these are C 3 clusters and the way they go and um, join to the um, nanotube which is growing determines whether it will be open ended or whether it will close or whether uh, what will be the length scale of the growth process. So, typically uh, this sort of uh, uh, units do uh, help in realizing uh, whether there will be a closing because this can be both sides can be open ended also when it is growing um, along a preferred axis. But um, in most of the cases we see that the carbon nanotubes do close in one end uh, to, to attain stability and uh, why, why it happens mainly because of the role of this uh, hexagons and pentagons and the way the carbon clusters keep on getting accumulated. When we come to multi wall nanotubes the pot possibilities are immense and therefore, there are very few ways that you can map to understand. As you see here this is a single wall and uh, as the carbon supply is coming the second wall can actually grow as an open ended wall or it this can close and the third wall can propagate. So, the, the, the way the multi walls evolve depends mostly on the way the carbon supply is and also it depends on the way the growth direction is. So, this is a contour which tells what are the different ways this multi wall uh, structure is uh, happening. Um, as you see here um, this can uh, unfoil like this and again go for the third growth or this can actually go uh, to close the second layer and so on. So, there are different combinations which are worked out, but as far as the multi wall uh, nanotube growth is concerned two parameters are important one is the uh, way the carbon supply is and the growth direction um, that proceeds during the uh, growth. So, both are important whereas, uh, for single wall growth mechanism it has also been uh, tried uh, theoretically through simulations to find out if uh, uncatalyzed growth is possible for single wall and what has been uh, found out is that uh, such uncatalyzed reactions are possible only uh, at temperatures of 2000 K to 3000 K. Therefore, um, for single wall nanotube definitely there is a much clearer mechanism than the multi wall and uh, what is impl implied here in the study is that the, um, the nucleation through the metal center is very very important for um, single wall nanotubes and the closure of this single wall nanotubes actually reduces the reactivity in other words makes the tube stronger therefore, the closing also occurs. And uh, how, how does this happen actually if we take a fluorine molecule and then the fluorine actually has uh, this nucleation sites of the metal of this metals lying in this direction then you can see the uh, single wall nanotube is actually propagating through these links. So, this is one of the way uh, that we can uh, visualize how a single wall can come compared to multi wall. So, transition metal surface decorated fullerene they nucleate the growth around the periphery and uh, what is the role of the catalyst there catalyst keeps on coming out along with the growth. So, th this sort of uh, catalyst atoms do stick to the edges of the carbon nanotube. So, catalyst atom chemisorbed onto the open edge and this keeps the tube from uh, scooting around the open edge this will ensure that pentagons and heptagons do not form. That is one of the reason why a long chain uh, single wall nanotube is possible with this sort of uh, 
uh, mechanism. And uh, if you really look at the way this field has grown uh, with this basic understanding of how to make a single wall nanotube or a multi wall nanotube, uh, sky is the limit because the way people have mapped different derivat derivatized uh, single wall nanotubes or taking it through some functional applications, there has been a skyrocketing um, <coughs> effort and uh, you can see here some of these view graphs just to highlight what all can happen. Here this has been used for electrical applications and um, uh, you can also spread this carbon nanotube like a screen you know uh, to go for large area um, deposition and as you see you can e even roll it to 6 feet um, on a paper or, or plastic substrate. So, um, processing of this carbon nanotubes to larger areas is possible and here in, uh, in this cartoon you can find that uh, the carbon nanotubes in the edges can be functionalized, function, when we say functionalized you actually oxidize it and convert it into COOH the terminal carbons and then you try to attach it to any mat material. As you can see here you can almost simulate uh, the sugar units here and uh, CG, AT um, pairs can be paired up which is also seen very clearly from the AFM pictures. So, uh, when you substitute this carbon nanotube then they show a contrast here. These are the carbon nanotubes that you see in the AFM uh, picture and uh, those which are highlighted here are the substituted ones. So, it is possible <laughs> to uh, go for uh, a variety of substitutions on this uh, single wall nanotube and if you want to make extensive substitutions then not just one you can try to oxidize it. The more you oxidize it the more you uh, generate COOH groups in the terminal positions and then you can actually attach a variety of molecules to it. Uh, and uh, uh, the research has now reached to the extent where you can actually do it in lab scale in a very defined way. So, this is one of the setup where uh, you can realize uh, single wall nanotube uh, preparation even on a lab scale. And uh, uh, the best part of uh, carbon nanotube as I mentioned in the earlier slide is the enrichment of this metallic carbon, nan met uh, carbon nanotubes and uh, we can also um, not only enrich uh, them, but we can go for preferential oxidation of this uh, nanotubes uh, to a larger extent. So, uh, as you as you would see from this picture that uh, with more and more of uh, selective oxidation the color of this nanotube solution changes. So, these are those uh, which are oxidized um, <coughs> which means more and more of uh, COOH groups are attached to the uh, terminal carbon. So, uh, we can uh, try to enrich that, but the best way to uh, characterize if you are able to really uh, <coughs> functionalize these uh, carbon nanotubes or whether they remain as um, pure nanotubes, Raman spectra is one of the best way to uh, analyze and uh, here are four important reflections that we should bear in mind which gives us a clue how to map the purity of it. The first one is your G mode which is the very important mode uh, um, which is G from graphite. This mode corresponds to planar vibration of carbon atoms and is present in most graphite like materials. Uh, so, this G band in uh, your single wall nanotube is shifted to lower frequencies relative to graphite and is split into several peaks. So, uh, this is uh, uh, the peak that you can map and if there are several splittings in this uh, as you can open this uh, peak you would see several splittings. Splittings really give the clue that these are single wall nanotubes whereas, the graphite um, will actually give a very intense single line. So, this is one way to map the uh, formation of single wall nanotube. Another one is the radial breathing mode which corresponds to the radial expansion contraction of the nanotube. Therefore, uh, the frequency depends on the nanotube diameter and can be estimated. As I told in uh, the previous lecture 
that we can actually alter the diameter of these nanotubes. So, this radial breathing mode is one measure by which you can analyze uh, the diameter. So, if you uh, because this is very sensitive and with the diameter of the tube this radial mode would sh shift. So, you can estimate whether you have uh, a preferred dimension or not. And uh, another uh, important mode is D mode is present in all graphite like carbons and originates from structural defects. So, this is uh, one important feature which will give us clue whether you have functionalized your carbon nanotube and this G D prime is also sub called D prime. This G prime is nothing but your second overtone of D and uh, the intensity of this will tell whether you have functionalized the single wall nanotube or not. Uh, for example, if you are uh, treating this with uh, nitric acid and then boiling it, then this peak would actually be a measure whether you have functionalized your nanotube or not. If this is really absent, then you say that it is a single wall nanotube. So, uh, this is not only a measure of the defect structure in your carbon nanotube, but this also tells whether you have functionalized it. So, this serves as a very good optimization for your single wall nanotubes. And when we come to the optical uh, properties of single wall nanotubes, you would see a typical um, absorption uh, peak for uh, carbon nanotubes, where uh, beyond the 3 electron volt, this is due to um, plasma uh, absorption, whereas there are peculiar uh, reflections due to S11, S22, M11. Uh, this S11 or S22 is actually to differentiate between metallic or semi metal um, carbon nanotubes. In semi metal zigzag nanotubes, uh, metallic this will be more prominent S22, it is also it can be called as E22 uh, if we do not know the metallicity or for the uh, semi metals. Uh, or semiconducting nanotubes, this is um, S11 reflection. So, these are two absorption peaks which really uh, play a very important role in mapping and uh, here again we see the profile of the excitation wavelength versus PL wavelength. As you would see here, these are plotted against the uh, unit vectors M and N. So, whatever numbers that you see here shows that for uh, M 0 uh, repeats, you do not see any photoluminescence, neither for yeah, M is equal to N. Okay. So, the values in the parenthesis clearly tells us what sort of uh, mapping or what sort of uh, orientation of the uh, nanotubes which are going to be effective for photoluminescence, but the good news is that carbon nanotubes show a very strong photoluminescence, but it is also dependent on the uh, chirality. So, depending on that we can uh, map the photoluminescence response. Um, as I told you this E 11 or S 11 is dependent on the metallic um, nanotube and this is for the semiconducting nanotube. So, if it is semiconducting then we mention this as S 22 specifically and if it is metallic uh, it is S 11 and this S 11 and which is nothing but E 11 in this diagram is a transition from V 1 to C 1. So, when the electron is getting excited to C 1 then a electron hole pair is actually formed which by a phonon assisted process relaxes and then the uh, emission comes out to be a C 1 to V 1 emission. This is what is responsible in the case of metallic um, nanotubes and this is also called as first Van Hove optical transition which, uh, which talks about uh, the transition that is responsible for uh, the uh, absorption and uh, in the case of uh, uh, <coughs> semiconducting single wall nanotubes you would see that the density of states are slightly different from the metallic nanotubes 
these are more much more discretized and uh, this sort of uh, density of states what you see here is nothing but uh, the influence of your one dimensional uh, structure. In one dimensional you would not see a continuous density of states. So, in a three, dim uh, in a three dimensional um, material uh, for a 3D the density of states actually would correspond like this, but uh, for a one dimensional uh, nanotube these are all discretized and therefore, you see this sort of pattern and uh, between the metallic and the semiconducting you can clearly see that the uh, density of states differ very differently and uh, these are the optical transitions which are responsible for uh, photoluminescence and uh, in the case of semiconducting uh, nanotubes it is C 2 to V 2 transitions which are responsible. So, excitation of uh, photoluminescence um, the an electron in the nanotube absorbs uh, via a S22 transition as I mentioned earlier and the electron and the hole rapidly relax uh, from C2 to C1 or uh, and from V2 to V1 and therefore, the C1 V1 trans, uh, transition is actually um, responsible for the light emission and uh, one thing that we need to understand here is the photoluminescence is not due to excitonic emission this is quite different from the other p l uh, situation where p l emission usually is a excitonic uh, um, <coughs> influence, but carbon nanotube photoluminescence is not a excitonic uh, luminescence uh, and this because it cannot be produced in metallic tubes the electron can be excited thus resulting in optical absorption, but in the case of carbon nanotube the hole is immediately filled by another electron because the electrons do keep coming and therefore, no exciton is actually produced which is responsible for photoluminescence. This is another thing that we should bear in mind. So, uh, critically if you look at uh, the photoluminescence behavior uh, the S 2 2 transition and S 1 1 transitions which are for uh, the metallic and semiconducting are also dependent on the tube diameter. So, depending on the tube diameter you can see the um, absorption will uh, yeah, absorption or the energy gap will vary and for let us take the case of S 1 1 uh, that is for metallic uh, uh, single wall nanotubes. Um, if the tube diameter is less than 1 nanometer then the band gap is much higher and the band gap becomes much much lower when the tube diameter increases. Uh, so, uh, this is one thing that we should bear in mind and also another important thing that we should find uh, uh, we should see is a crossover transition from C 1 to V 1 and C 2 to V 1 um, is also possible although they are uh, dipole forbidden transitions. So, all this do influence the photoluminescence and based on this several applications have been tampered. One is uh, the use of carbon nanotubes uh, as a glucose sensor because carbon nanotubes glow you can use this for mapping certain molecules or for mapping some uh, study. Uh, the best part is it is excited in near IR range of the electromagnetic spectrum therefore, it is safer to the cells and uh, this is uh, the another point is the glow that comes out is different from the other dyes therefore, it is very selective and continuous fluorescence also does not bleach the carbon nanotube therefore, uh, continuous radiation is also possible and it is ideal for sensor applications in the body and what you see here is a glucose monitor. If you have a glucose sensors uh, capped with the carbon nanotube then you see the uh, mapping can be uh, or the glow can be much uh, intense and rich and uh, more the glucose present in the sh uh, in the blood then you will see a uh, very high luminescence. So, that could be used as a mapping and this is the typical emission spectra of your carbon nanotube if you excite it at 770 then the emission actually comes at 1300 uh, nanometers. So, this is a typical spectrum for carbon nanotubes. Uh, also, there are range of applications for carbon nanotube already realized 
in the market and in the industry. Um, this is a cartoon which tells that uh, it is having a very vivid antibacterial uh, effect and you can see here um, the, the influence of the carbon nanotube compared to, uh, compared to uncoated or um, a region without carbon nanotube. Uh, clearly you can see that the bacterial um, presence can be removed using the presence of carbon nanotube and this is also acting as a very good uh, filter uh, because of its very high surface area and uh, as you would see here this is a filter that is currently employed in the US army. Almost everyone is provided with a backpack where this sort of mm, filters are being carried by the soldiers for getting pure water. So, this has a lot of uh, advantage in uh, filtering uh, biological impurities uh, and uh, <coughs> in the sports arena people have also used this uh, to improve the strength. Uh, it is used in uh, uh, tennis racket, it is used in baseball stuff and also uh, there are other uh, selective applications where in AFM uh, tip uh, carbon nanotube coated AFM tips have been produced. So, this is one of a very prime uh, application which is being currently exploited and also this is being used uh, in composite materials as you would know you have a matrix which is polymer and then you try to reinforce with uh, some fillers like fiberglass or Kevlar, but carbon um, nanotubes added to this uh, matrix seems to enlarge the toughness and the strength of the material to a larger extent. Uh, one other application that we can see here is uh, in the use of uh, uh, <coughs> displays. Uh, this is a map of your cathode ray tube where you know that the uh, electron guns impinge on the phosphors and then you get a full color spectrum, but you can get much sharper contrast and color purity if you are going to use carbon nanotubes in uh, field emission process because in field emission compared to uh, the cathode ray uh, operation uh, you see here it is a blend of three electron guns mixing the colors whereas in uh, field emission uh, displays the important point is uh, behind each of the pixel there is electron that is generated. So, it brings color purity and sharpness to a greater extent and carbon nanotubes are able to improve on this contrast and uh, <coughs> it is also used in uh, nano electronics now um, carbon nanotubes can be used. Uh, so, uh, there are several applications which are being realized for carbon nanotubes. I, I cannot go on uh, showing more uh, view graphs on the applications, but just to highlight the interest that carbon nanotubes have uh, generated compared to most of the composites uh, that are currently being used. You can see uh, the way carbon nanotubes have taken over is uh, phenomenal and especially in the last 10 years there has been marked uh, changes happening and uh, although these are some of the uh, fiber composites which are still being used, but carbon nanotubes have certainly generated a range of interest for applications. Next I would like to go to graphenes. Uh, graphenes as I mentioned in the previous lecture graphene is uh, in two dimensional form and uh, this is also uh, by and large agreed as a material for all seasons. As I told you if you uh, if we can really map how the 3 D is uh, and uh, uh, 1 D and uh, 0 dimensional carbons are evolving, we found out in the previous lecture that graphene can act as the base material from which the folding can happen to realize uh, either a buckyball or a um, single wall nanotube. So, <coughs> uh, just to highlight uh, the importance, uh, it was uh, uh, these two gentlemen who really did a pioneering work in getting graphene into prominence and uh, this is again a serendipity because they uh, gambled with the unusual ideas. Uh, so, th these two gentlemen both of them are Russians by birth, but they 
uh, both serve as professors in the University of Manchester, um, Professor Andrew Graham and uh, Professor Novoselov and uh, both of them uh, tried a very unusual way of getting this graphene to picture and this is what we would see for the next few slides. Um, what is this graphene? The graphene as we pointed out this is a two dimensional hexagonal lattice uh, from where we can either achieve this or this or we can actually get these layers of graphene and uh, this is the basis for C60 for nanotubes and for graphite and uh, among strongest bond in nature um, and uh, if you really map uh, this two dimensional crystal you would find that the melting temperature of thin films decreases rapidly with temperature and therefore mono layers generally are unstable but in 2004 experimental discovery of graphene shows high quality 2D uh, <coughs> crystals and this seems to be coming possibly because of the 3D rippling which stabilizes the crystal and uh, if you actually find out um, the uh, the representation of this graphene can even extend to 800 nanometers long. So, you can make stretch long stretches of graphene and uh, the main reason why it stabilizes is because of the 3D rippling um, which stabilizes a two dimensional platform. How to make this graphene and this is how the discovery of graphene emerged strangely cheap and uh, easy. Uh, we can draw with a piece of graphite or repeatedly peel it off with a scotch tape and that is the first experiment that was conducted by these two gentlemen. They just used uh, scotch tape, put it on graphite and keep on peeling it and what comes out is nothing but a two dimensional graphite and uh, it was almost thought graph uh, graphite cannot be broken up to such a uh, measure and uh, uh, growing a two dimensional uh, carbon was impossible, but uh, this hap turned out to be the most simplest way they could engineer. So, place samples on specific thickness on silicon wafer, the wrong thicknesses of silicon leaves graphene um, invisible and graphene visible through feeble interference effect different thicknesses are of different colors. So, we can easily map from ACM what is the thickness of the graphene layer that you have. Now, we can map it using optical microscope for a quick analysis SEM uh, and AFM can give you a proper idea. As you can see here um, optical microscope image of a resulting flake which you can take from a, a sticky tape and then put it on graphite then whatever you peel it would actually come out like, uh, like a thick residue which is sticking to the tape and then you can actually put it back into a mica sheet or glass sheet which will give you a thin uh, film of uh, graphene. So, we can actually use this graphene as metallic contact in case if we want to study any um, uh, electrical studies of some other metal. So, the graphene films are actually visualized by atomic force microscope and this is the way uh, it has been done and as you could see here the thickness of this graphene can be mapped using AFM and this is the TM study which clearly shows patches of graphene here and here is the SEM micrograph of a graphene which shows all the crystal phases of this film that is present. So, it is possible to easily calibrate the thickness of uh, graphene. Uh, just one more mention of how we can make this graphene. Um, low cost uh, synthesis of large scale graphenes can be attempted using chemical vapor deposition and uh, metal layers uh, like nickel, cobalt, platinum, ruthenium uh, is another al alternative technique uh, that can be employed. Metal films example nickel on uh, silica silicon dioxide is exposed to a flow of hydro hydrocarbon gas. Uh, usually it is methane at high temperatures causing the carbon saturation of the metal. This is followed by rapid cooling. This is the trick we need to adopt not just heating, but once you do a rapid cooling here of the sample then 
there is a decrease in the solubility of carbon in uh, nickel which will come out as a graphene sheet. So, it is uh, actually a precipitation process of carbon uh, in the form of ultra thin graphitic uh, sheets which is nothing but your uh, graphene layers. So, this is the way to realize um, using chemical vapor deposition. Graphene is actually uh, a single layer of graphite as we have seen and uh, uh, the carbon carbon bond in graphene is uh, typically of this order and it is sp2 hybridized. Um, <coughs> actually if you see uh, we have partially filled p z or p pi orbitals which are uh, perpendicular to the plane of the lattice and these are responsible for providing electrons for conduction. So, it is more like a benzene uh, ring where your pi orbitals are perpendicular to the plane and your um, sigma orbitals stabilize the bonding and uh, therefore, uh, due to this out of plane orbitals interaction between graphene layers and supporting substrates or between different layers also influence the electronic property. So, this is the way uh, we can try to engineer uh, the pi orbitals are the ones which are responsible for um, any interaction with the substrate. So, this gives also uh, a very good glue uh, or adhesive property for the graphene to stick to a particular substrate. When we look at the uh, Fermi surface of this graphenes, uh, this gives a another uh, different dimension to the understanding of electronic properties because this is a two dimensional graphene therefore, the way the uh, electronic property is defined in graphene is completely different from that of a 3D metal and uh, as you would see the Fermi surface of um, graphene uh, the plot of E k versus k which is nothing but your wave numbers gives us a different contour for your Brillouin zone. What you see here is the Fermi surface here which is uh, denoted by this black uh, circle and uh, against a conventional uh, system which is confined in 2D dimension here we see that these there are 6 double uh, cones and this is a hexagonal Brillouin zone which is mapped and this is your conduction band and this is your uh, valence band and they are actually separated by these 6 points ok. And because of this, because of this the there is a linear behavior between the uh, E and K parameter and uh, therefore, both the electrons and holes at this point will have a 0 effective mass and therefore, these points are actually called as direct points because they behave like direct fermions having a spin of half. And if you look at the typical 2D surface of, of a material which is confined in a two dimensional space, this is how it should look like. But for graphene you have a very different Brillouin zone that accounts for the conductivity of uh, this uh, uh, graphene sheets. Uh, so, in if you take uh, the metallic directions and you try to map it, these are the 6 metallic um, directions in which the electrical conductivity is uh, uh, confined and in case of uh, semiconductor um, <coughs> carbon nanotubes or um, the graphene sheets you would see a opening of this band gap coming between the Fermi surface across the Fermi surface between the valence and the conduction band. And uh, typically if you map your resistivity as a function of gate voltage you would see a very different picture compared to uh, the other uh, metals. So, if you make a plot of uh, resistance as a function of a gate voltage you would see this is mostly a ampipolar um, dependence that is uh, observed for, uh, for, for the gate voltage because you can see the shift here towards one direction and this is for <coughs> varying temperatures. Uh, from 5 k to 300 k you can see that there is a very clear response for this graphene sheets uh, against the gate, gate voltage and also the plot of um, this uh, conductivity as a function of gate voltage shows this ampipolar um, property 
and uh, the hall um, measurement also gives the same feature as that of the resistance. Uh, on the right side map you have the picture of a AFM picture which talks about the thickness that we can achieve in uh, such samples. The lighter region what you see here is nothing but the thinness past which is uh, roughly of uh, 0.5 nanometer and as you go towards the substrate you can see that it is varying from 0.5 to 2 nanometer. When we uh, consider the strength of graphene it is much more uh, interesting to observe that the graphene can be more stronger than even steel the strongest steel because the uh, the strength is measured to be 42 Newton per meter and uh, if you actually take 1 meter square of uh, steel and try to calculate the uh, breaking strength it will only amount to 0 0.084 Newton per meter. Therefore, between graphene sheet and the um, uh, steel there is uh, a tremendous increase in the uh, mechanical strength. So, if you are actually going to spread 1 meter square of hammock like this, uh, this is your hammock and if you are going to spread for 1 meter square actually graphene sheet can take load up to 4 kgs like putting a cat inside this hammock. So, that much of strength can be derived out of um, graphenes and therefore, uh, it, it can be used for many mechanical applications. Uh, in terms of uh, optical transparency it absorbs only 2.3 percent of light in intensity therefore, a thinner graphene sheet say one or two layers of graphene almost will give you 90 percent transmittance. So, it can be used as, uh, as a um, transparent electrode also. The electrical resistivity of graphene is uh, given by uh, this form sigma is equal to E n u. If your uh, charge carrier density which is unusually large which we can measure from Hall resistance your n is of the order of 10 power 12 centimeter uh, square and the mu that is your mobility is very huge. So, if you uh, compare that and try to calculate your resistance, resistance comes to be around 31 uh, ohms and uh, uh, for a hammock measuring 1 meter square that we showed uh, the resistance will typically be of 31 uh, ohm which is very very less. And therefore, if you make a comparison between uh, graphene and other semiconductors like silicon or germanium or gallium arsenide, you can see here that band gap is, uh, is nearly a semi metal um, and uh, compared to silicon. But the point that we need to uh, note here is electron mobility is unusually very very high and therefore, this can find use in many of the applications compared to traditional semiconductors. As of now, the most preferred one for uh, semiconductor applications is indium arsenide because the mobility values are of the order of 16000, uh, <coughs> but uh, the uh, graphene mobility seems to even surpass indium arsenide and uh, this also has a very low um, lattice constant. The dielectric constant also is very very low compared to any of the other semiconducting materials and therefore, this makes it a very good candidate for semiconductor applications as well. So, what are the possible applications high carrier mobility even at highest electric field uh, they largely are unaffected by doping and therefore, we can actually go for a ballistic electron transport over uh, micro, uh, less than micron distances and uh, this can actually lead to uh, applications in room temperature transistors and uh, energy gap is actually controlled by width of the graphene strip and therefore, we can actually see etching will be difficult consistently and random edge configuration causes the uh, scattering uh, if you are going to uh, modify the properties of the uh, uh, graphene strip. 
uh, in terms of other applications uh, we can look for very high tensile strength and uh, hydrogen storage also has been uh, noted to be uh, remarkably high uh, for uh, graphene. Graphene based quantum computation is another thing which is being uh, probed now. Uh, I will just take you through few applications before um, I finish. Um, generally uh, for uh, this carbon nanotubes and uh, graphene and fullerenes the spectrum of application is very wide. Uh, carbon nanotubes in particular has already been uh, applied in all these areas. So, I may not be able to run through all the applications, but you can see here it is from electronics to biological applications to magnetic storage uh, and also in several of uh, our household applications this has found a very useful candidate. Um, for example, um, when, when we try to pattern or make graphene sheets, it is easily possible to make a graphene sheet like this. Um, if you pattern your nickel uh, film of this form, uh, we can selectively get a graphene sheet like this uh, using a CVD process and this can be used for application. So, um, so patterning graphene sheets is not uh, difficult and um, graphene can also play as a very good metallic contact in transistors, field effect transistors. As you can see from this contour, it, you can easily make the graphite sheet which is lying here, graphenes uh, can be made and then we can put uh, several electrodes for this uh, transistor applications. And uh, as I pointed out uh, to you, uh, depending on the layer thickness, if it is one layer of graphene sheet, then the optical properties are going to be very high of the order of 98 percent. But if you are going to make a thicker graphene sheet, then you can easily calibrate using the optical transmittance, it will fall down and uh, therefore, we can uh, have a precise control over that. And uh, it is also reported uh, in OLEDs, if you are going to use uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, then uh, we can actually use this for tuning the colors. For example, um, if you put uh, single wall nanotubes in buffer layers here, which is in between. If you put buffer layers, holes are actually blocked and recombination takes place uh, in the transport layer and you can get selectively uh, red. But if you are not going to put uh, uh, carbon nanotube, then the emission will be green. So, this is mainly meant for modulating the charge carrier transport and therefore, the combination of the excitons can be mapped to come either in the transport layer or towards the uh, conducting layers. So, uh, you can actually fine tune the light emission by adding uh, carbon nanotubes in OLEDs. Here also uh, nanotube cathodes can be used for uh, getting preferred colors and uh, you can also see that the threshold electric field for different materials are given and uh, carbon nanotube seems to have a very low threshold electric field. Therefore, you can use this for display uh, applications and already a carbon nanotube cathode has been experimented which gives very sharp uh, color feature. And, uh, in hydrogen storage, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, carbon materials have been explored. Uh, you can see the single wall uh, nanotubes uh, with the lowest purity uh, giving uh, I hydrogen storage uh, ca um, capability of 5 to 10 percent. Uh, those which are currently being used are this graphitic nanofibers um, and uh, those are actually having a very high uh, hydrogen storage capacity but single wall nanotubes also seem to have a appreciable amount of hydrogen storage and this is still being improvised for uh, practical applications. Lastly, I just want to uh, tell you that this is not only a research effort, but this has become a business venture as of now and throughout the globe um, we see uh, many companies have started producing in larger scale. And there is a lot of activity as you would map here 
many companies are from uh, US which are already producing carbon nanotubes in a preferred way and uh, there are several activities going on in uh, uh, Europe. We also have uh, isolated activities in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. We do not have much activity both in uh, South America, Africa and also in India we do not have any carbon nanotube producing companies per se, but uh, the way the companies have evolved uh, this gives us a glimpse of what is in store and therefore many things are going to happen and uh, just to conclude um, as I have already mentioned about graphene, graphene seems to be the basic um, material for all seasons and uh, if we can study further uh, get more insights on to the chemistry or the physics of graphene then more and more novel properties will generate and uh, uh, this will have outstanding physical, chemical, electrical, optical and structural property, properties and uh, for sure these are going to find more applications in the days to come in field of uh, uh, displays, solar cells and energy storage devices. So, uh, to conclude uh, we have actually seen uh, three forms of carbon uh, namely buckyball, uh, then one dimensional uh, carbon nanotube and also two dimensional graphene sheets.